when I was growing up, we had people in our family and others that were saying it was ungodly to have stuff. In other words, there were people that equated things, material things with the devil or with being worldly. I struggled with that as a young man, as I was um, going to college at the University of Washington. I was also working um, at the bank. You know, some of you know that I worked in financial institutions pretty much my entire career, except for the time I worked at McDonald's and Skippers. I had, I had two fast food jobs, but after that, it was all financials, amen. Uh, and so I was having a problem with this. Because at work, I'm seeing how all kinds of people from all walks of life, Christians, Catholic, Jews, Muslims, white people, black people, Hispanic people, Hawaiian people, Asian people, everybody, when it came to the financial realm, it was almost like everybody had potential to either exponentially increase, just like everybody else, that have discovered how to do that. And it seemingly didn't have anything to do with who they were, where they came from, how they got there. And so the Lord began to share with me as a young man that he reigns on the just as well as the unjust. And so I'm saying that it is possible for a sinner to uh, appear blessed. <laughs> Amen. You all may think about that and say, wow, sinners are blessed. Well, they, they, they might have a few uh, advantages in certain areas, um, but the Bible tells us clearly what is the profit of man to gain the whole world and then to lose his soul. So, so in other words, then if, if the person is a sinner and they're gaining all this stuff, and at the same time, they don't have their soul that is wrapped up in the salvation of our Lord and Jesus Christ, then it's all for naught. But amen, but let's keep going. We're talking about this, this vow of poverty that, that this spirit that I heard growing up. Now, the scripture says, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. But a vow of poverty? Now, um, again, I had challenges with that because that didn't equate with what I was seeing in my own experiences in life. Just like all of you have your own experiences in life. Some of you from the time that you were born until now, you've had multiple different types of financial statuses up and down. You've had economic increase and you may have had economic depressions in your life. Uh, it, it, the, it, the Lord reigns in the just and the unjust. You've had all seasons of life of financial statuses. Some of us more so than others. But the Lord asking us to take a vow of poverty. When Jesus said, I am come. That they might have life and life more abundantly. Now, on the other hand. There was the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel came out of another set of teachings that you could just go to God. Name it and claim it. Now, there's a problem with that too. Now, we do have rights and privileges that come from our relationship with God, but it absolutely comes out of obedience unto the Lord. So that blows away the doctrine of the prosperity gospel because God requires us to do his will, God requires us 
to be in his word, to live holy, and all the other things that he requires. God is not to be viewed as a spiritual Santa Claus. Because God, unlike Santa Claus, sacrificed himself to live on the earth as a man and to die a death for sins that he did not commit and even be killed on a cross for a death that he didn't deserve. Does God demand our obedience? Absolutely, he does. He gave us his all. Hallelujah. But it gives us the right to experience him in the fullness. Why do you think Jesus, when he said that, when he said, I am come, that you might have life and life more abundantly, if he expected you to live your whole life always asking for stuff? always being in a state of insufficiency or deficiency. God has given us the right to experience him in the fullness. Philippians 4.19 says this, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Wait a minute. What does it say? My God, what? Shall supply what? all our need. Wow. According to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That means that every person here, every person, every person can have your need supply. You know what you got to do? You got to ask God to reveal your need. Ask God to reveal your need. Now, when you read that in the King James Version, it's N-E-E-D. It is not plural with an S on it. It's singular. God shall supply all your need. Here's the revelation in that. At any given point in time in our walk with the Lord, our souls are yearning for God. The Bible says, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. Hallelujah. So there is a deep intrinsic need that we have that only God can fill. And I know many people try to fill that need with other stuff. That's why people get caught up in addictions and people get caught up in crime. Um, my wife and I were having a discussion the other day and we were talking about why do people steal? Why do people steal? And we were talking about that people who go and steal money or something from another person and then they take the proceeds of what they stole, the money, and spend it on stupid stuff. Entertainment materialism. You stole from somebody to do that? I'm just saying, it's that spirit that Jesus talked about in John 10 and 10. Understand this, if Jesus put that in the atmosphere for us to recognize and acknowledge that the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy, you got to understand that that takes many forms. But at the same time, we got the blessings. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 11 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. This is 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. And he says, Every man, according to as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. 
and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always having all sufficiency, look at that. Ye always having all sufficiency in all things. I'm gonna read it again. Ye always having all su sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Wait a minute, what happened to the vow of poverty? And ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he have dispersed abroad, he have given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that minister of seed to the sore, both minister bread for your food, hallelujah, and multiply your seed sown, hallelujah, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, hallelujah, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. You should highlight that. Because this is consistent with the second half of John 10, 10. This is consistent. Now, so for people to say that God does not want us to have an experience that prospers us, that is fallacy. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Hallelujah. Even heaven. Now, let me say this. The focus of our lives ought not be the pursuit of wealth or prosperity. As a matter of fact, that scripture in John 3, John 2, when it says prosper and be in her, that word prosper is translated to mean successful. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may be a success, even as your soul is a success. Because once your soul has been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and you have been saved unto the salvation of the Lord, your soul has prospered. Your soul has success because your soul will not go to hell. In addition to that, what we're doing here tonight is we're examining John 10 and 10 and looking at it from another perspective. Now, now you may say, well, wait a minute, Elder, God must have been talking about the afterlife in heaven. Well, well, let's take a look at that too. The Bible tells us that heaven has many mansions where we will dwell with Jesus. John 14, one through three says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself that where I am there, ye may be also. The Lord tells us he's got this place for us in heaven mansions. Now, they ain't the kind of mansions that we're used to on earth. They're heavenly mansions, which we can't even imagine. Another scripture says, precious gemstones will adorn heaven. Revelation 21 verses 10 through 12 says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and the 12 gates, 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Further on in the Revelation 21, it says the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was one of pearl and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And finally, the 22nd chapter of Revelation, verse one and two says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God 
and of the land. And in the midst of the street of it, and either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Church, that doesn't sound like a vow of poverty to me. Does it sound like that to you? We are looking at scripture that is giving us the mindset because if we have been influenced by the enemy at a certain level, then it would be hard for some people to take God completely at his word. Now watch this, Mark 10 verses 29 through 31, and Jesus is speaking again. It's again coming out of the mouth of the Lord. He says, Jesus answered and said, verily I say unto you that there is no man that have left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. He threw that in there to let us know that the enemy might be around and in the world to come eternal life, but that many that are first shall be last and the last first. That was a promise of increase from the Lord. He said a hundredfold in this life and you get eternal life once we leave here. So when we analyze John 10 and 10, the thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. If you look at the duality of those natures, the duality of good and the evil happening at the same time, then you can surmise that there is a battle for your personal and your soul's well being. That's why the Lord spoke. In the same verse, he wanted us to understand what's happening in the earth. Now, let's break it down a little bit. The thief. Well, what is the thief? The Greek word for thief in this scripture, John 10 and 10, is, is kleptes, which means a stealer. And it also signifies that it's a person, literally or figuratively. Then I did a little bit of further research on this because Jesus called the enemy the thief in this particular passage of scripture. And it said that it is the recurrent inability to resist urges to steal items that they really don't need and that they have, have very little value to them, but they're stealing for the sake of stealing. Does the devil need your money? Does the devil need your stuff? Does the devil need your health? Does the devil need anything of physical substance from you? No. He's after your soul. Because if he can disrupt those things in your natural life, then it could cause certain ones to take their eye off Jesus and take their eye off obedience and take their eye off the promises of God and fall into this mindset of lack, this mindset of, of loss, this mindset of deficiency, this mindset of never enough. Also that word kleptes is the same root word of the word kleptomania or a kleptomaniac, which is a mental health disorder that people cannot resist the urge to steal. Now watch this. There are certain someones, certain things that might be around your life that's always taking from you or at least trying. Another definition, same with this word kleptes, 
talks about that the, the thief does it by stealth, which means they do it undercover behind your back without using force or violence. So that means that the enemy tries to steal from us without us even being aware that he's in the room. That's just defining the thief as Jesus spoke it in John 10 and 10. Now, Jesus said something about the thief, that he cometh not but for. Watch this. He says, cometh not but for. Ladies and gentlemen, church, brothers and sisters, the enemy won't show up unless there's a purpose he's trying to accomplish. If the enemy is anywhere in your space, he's got a purpose, which the Lord just told us, it is to steal, kill, and destroy. Now let's break that down. Let's, the word steal is klepto. The thief was kleptase. To steal is klepto. Same kind of word, but it says takes away property that belongs to another. And to kill, the Greek word for kill is thuo, which means to sacrifice by fire, to slaughter, to slay, to remove life. And there are many people walking around today, Christians, that are walking around with no life. They have no joy. They have no no, no, no vitality to them because they've, they've been a victim of some atrocities from the enemy and it has killed their joy. It has killed their spirit. It has killed their ambition. It has killed their drive. And so now anytime that someone mentions anything for them, they're like, oh no, that ain't for me. I can't do it. It's all no. And they have no aspiration anymore. They've lost their motivation. If there's anywhere in your life that you have lost your motivation, if you have lost your motivation to excel, if you have lost your motivation to produce, if you've lost your motivation to get up and to go and to be somewhat productive in the capacity that God has given you, if you've lost that, then I, I encourage you to pray and ask God to revive you in that area, hallelujah, so that you can be resurrected in that area so that that thing can come back to life in you. Because the next level that the enemy, that the thief, that Jesus told us, he said is a progression. He says the steal, the kill, and the final piece of that was to destroy. The word for that in the Greek is apollomi, which means to perish, to lose, to put an end to an existence of what used to be, but now is completely gone. I remember one of my um, fraternity brothers um, who was a chemical engineer and he was a little bit older than us while we were going through school. And he had a great education, had all the skill sets, but somewhere along the way he had something happen to him and he lost his motivation. And so a chemical engineer who you know right now could get a job making $200,000 somewhere, right? With that kind of a skill set, this man was working at Circle K store because he lost his, his, his ability to even want to do what God had gifted him to do. And he resigned himself to just working at the store, but he had so much more potential. In other words, the enemy destroyed his ability to think that if God has given him the power to get wealth, he certainly wasn't thinking about it. And so he chose this lifestyle of living beyond or beneath his, his privilege. So that's what the enemy is trying to accomplish. Because again, if the enemy can get us to get off track, to lose momentum, to lose motivation, to lose interest, and to stop producing, to stop going, to stop working, to stop doing all those things, then our focus can be on that because now we go into a downward spiral. Now we're in the same exact frame of mind that Kleptase wanted us to be in. So that now we're not looking at the abundance that God has given us through Jesus, the life of Jesus and his res resurrection and the blood that he shed and the promises that he gave us. 
And he said, I am come that they might have life. So in other words, God is saying, wait a minute, in spite of all of that, that the enemy is trying to do to leave you feeling scarce, to leave you feeling that you're at an end, to leave you feeling that you're in a state of not existing anymore, leaving you feeling like you have low self-efficacy, low self-esteem, low drive, low everything. We bind that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, hallelujah. And the Lord is calling you forth today, tonight. The word abundantly in that scripture is the Greek word for perisimos, perisos, which means a sense of beyond. It's, it's, it's defined as super abundant in quantity, superior in quality. The implication is it's excessive. There's an advantage. You're exceeding very high, beyond measure, more, superfluous, vehement. Abundance by definition, meaning having all your needs met and having something left over to give to others. Hallelujah. Here's an analogy. If a, if a woman goes to the store and she has to get $50 worth of groceries to help her household for this particular week, but she has $45, but she needs 50, she's at the store. She's shopping out of her deficiency because she doesn't have the exact dollar amount that she needs based on the prices to bring back home what she needs. So she cuts corners because she has to shop out of deficiency. Now, contrast that same woman. If that same woman now has $55, but she goes to the store to shop for $50, she's now shopping out of her abundance because she has more than what she needs to fulfill the need in her household. And this is what God is wanting us to see tonight, that our lives really and truly, when you throw away all the, the, the shade and if you turn on the lights and if you take an inventory of everything that God has given us, we have an abundance of things around us. We just have to recognize and begin to remove the mindset of deficiency and not to operate out of deficiency and don't even call it deficient, call it increase hallelujah and let god show you how he's already made you a life of abundance praise the lord the bible says as we went to philippians 4 19 my god shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by christ jesus luke 6 and 38 we read it every sunday give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, an elder, in the midst of all my stuff, I gotta give, that's what the word is saying. The word said, you give, it'll be given back to you. Praise the Lord. Then 2 Corinthians 1 and 20 says, for the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God. Church, if God says yes to the promise, then you say, amen. If God has promised you anything, your response is amen. The Bible just said the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. If God's given you a promise, say amen, hallelujah. I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture tonight, but we're in Bible study, hallelujah. Second Peter, first chapter, verses two through four says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow, here it is, folks. Second Peter, God gave us a, a key, a nugget right here. He says, his divine power has given us everything that pertains in the life and godliness. You have everything that you need for your life and godliness. That's Second Peter 1, verses two through four. You have everything that pertains unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him, right? You got to know about God, read the Bible, come to church. Then it says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. You want to know what God's will is? 
His will is his promises. If God gives you a promise in the Bible, that's his will. God will not make a promise that is contrary to his will. If God gave you a promise, that's his will. Hallelujah. And that by these, the Bible says here in the scripture that you might be partakers of the divine nature. What does that mean? That means if I am walking in the knowledge and the revelation of the promises of God, and if I understand that God is giving me this because he promised it to me, then in that instant, I am partaking in his divine nature. His divine nature is God is a giver. God is the greatest example of a giver that you'll ever, ever, ever know. And so if we are understanding that we're walking in the promises of God, then by virtue of this scripture, by revelation, by the rhema of the Lord, he says that we might be partakers of the divine nature. Here's the point having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, remember when the Bible says in John 10, 10, that the thief cometh not before to steal, to kill and destroy. Well, his, his effort is to help us to get off track and off focus so that we are all messed up with God because we're focused on the negativity, the lack, the deficiencies and all of that. And the enemy would cause us to be in that frame of mind. But the Bible says in 2 Peter one and four, he says that you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped that corruption that is in the world through lust. What is he saying? God, by his very nature of us giving him his due in our lives and us walking in his promises, we become partakers of his divine nature. Church, God's provision is through God's promises. And I'm going to end with this. Do you remember? You remember the children of Israel. When Moses went on to be with the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Joshua 1, first chapter, verse 2 and 3, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Understand what this means. The children of Israel were in the middle of the wilderness. God spoke, Joshua, arise, go over the Jordan, you and all the people, to the land that I just gave you. Now, in that moment, they were still in the wilderness. But in that same instant, the land was already theirs. The moment God spoke the promise, the transference of ownership happened in the spirit that moment. They didn't manifest it because until they stepped on it. God told them, get up, arise, go over the Jordan and to the land which I give you. In every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given to you. As I said unto Moses. The revelation is this. If there are still yet promises of God that are still yet to come to pass in your life, then start asking God to show you where to walk, to appropriate your promises, to appropriate that abundant life that he promised. In the instant that he made the promise, it was the same instant that it became yours. But we still have the requirement to go out and to walk it out. And that's what he was telling the children of Israel. What must we do? When we hear that scripture, John 10 and 10, the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, to kill and destroy. And I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Church, the enemy is trying to rock our worlds right now with what he's doing. Kleptase, klepto, kleptomania, trying to steal thievery, kill and destroy us. 
our souls. Well, at the same time, God is giving us the opportunity to walk into his promises, to have the abundant life, to be a partaker of his divine nature so that we can have victory in this life. Church, we are not defeated. We are victorious in the name of Jesus. So be proactive. Pray according to what you know that God's will is. And remember, his promises are his will. God will not make a promise that is contrary to his will. Hallelujah. So I leave you with this final scripture, 1 John 5 and 14. And it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, mm -hmm. he heareth us. Yes. Church, pray according to the will of God. Pray according to the promises that you read in your Bible. Pray according to that and then walk it out and keep the mindset that I don't care what the devil is trying to steal, kill, and destroy in my life or around me, to my friend's life, to my family's life. I don't care what's going on. I am going to walk in the abundance that the Lord Jesus Christ had promised us because he had come to save me and he's given me this life more abundant. Change your mindset and have an abundant mindset versus a scarcity mindset because the enemy, he's trying to bring that scarcity, but we have a better way to go. God has given us all things that pertain to life and the godliness. Church, walk in the Lord's abundance. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Walk in the Lord's abundance.